Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for your warm and uh, welcoming words. Um, as a former politician, I used to be a member of parliament in the Netherlands. I used to speak for a long time, and although we have very strict rules in our Dutch parliament, if you get only 12 minutes, then uh, usually you end up speaking 20. So I warn you, and you should warn me, when it's about 10 minutes, just give me a sign, and then I know how to uh, end my uh, speech to you. Well, thank you very much for being here in the afternoon. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be here and uh, to talk to you about uh, specific issues as were outlined in the program. And because I have about 12 minutes, I will start immediately with the Jogjakarta principles. Uh, at the end of 2006, a group of uh, experts, legal experts, came together in the city of Jogjakarta in Indonesia, and where they convened and they uh, codified from existing human rights treaties and human rights jurisprudence, all those uh, human rights that are applicable uh, for everybody in the world. So also for people um, with uh, the homosexual orientation or uh, with uh, gender identity um, issues. Um, the Jogjakarta principles in itself is not a document that was um, endorsed by the United Nations, but the rights that are uh, um, written down in the Jogjakarta principles, they are, because they are from international treaties. I would like to mention one treaty to you, which is very important also in this region of the world, and that's the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. In that covenant, a lot of uh, very basic human rights uh, are written down, uh, like the right not to be discriminated, um, the right to uh, physical uh, integrity, uh, the right to privacy, and all those rights um, are very important uh, when we talk about sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, let me give you... Um, an example how uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights works, because many countries in the world have ratified um, the uh, covenant, and then, of course, we need to see how it works in practice. And therefore, we need NGOs, non-governmental organizations, who have to check if their government is really complying with the content of the uh, ICCPR. And so the ICCPR knows a body, it's called the uh, United Nations Human Rights Committee, and every year they are scrutinizing different countries in the world to see if they are complying with uh, this covenant. Um, to give you one example, uh, last year I was in Geneva where uh, the Human Rights Committee convenes when uh, the Human Rights Committee um, was scrutinizing the country Cameroon in Africa. And as you know, in Cameroon, homosexual conduct is criminalized. And unfortunately, almost on a daily basis, we see that uh, especially gay men are arrested and put in prison. Um, there was one man a few months ago who sent a text message to another man uh, because he wanted to meet him in the lobby of a hotel. And when he got to the lobby of the hotel, he was arrested. So the other man worked together with the police. He was arrested and he was sentenced to three years imprisonment. Three years simply for having a date with another homosexual men. There was no conduct involved, no behavior, just making a date with somebody, can, you can end up uh, in prison in Cameroon for three years. Unfortunately, last week before I came here, I received new uh, messages that other men are also now uh, detained and waiting their trial, simply because somebody says this man is gay. So that's what's happening, and the Human Rights Committee, when I uh, attended that meeting, was scrutinizing uh, Cameroon and decided uh, that Cameroon um, was violating the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, 
and um, they recommended the country of Cameroon to decriminalize. So that's the way the UN system works uh, with this international covenant. Um, as you know, I work for Human Rights Watch. I'm based in New York, and every year with uh, a group of international NGOs and with a core group of LGBT-friendly countries, we organize big events at the United Nations, always on the International Day for Human Rights, the 10th of December. And so in 2007, we introduced the Yogyakarta principles uh, to the UN. And uh, we found Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay uh, uh, willing to introduce this document. And it was for the first time the Yogyakarta principles were on the agenda of the United Nations. And it was wonderful to see that those three Latin American countries took this role. Because usually in the world, especially countries, there are about 80 to 85 countries which criminalize homosexual conduct. They usually say, you know, people who talk about homosexuality, they're from the West and they're trying to impose their standards and um, their morals on us. And uh, this is not African, for instance, or not uh, from the Caribbean. But so it was a surprise to the rest of the world that Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay introduced the Yogyakarta principles and spoke in favor of it. Um, in 2008, we organized with uh, the same group a joint statement, um, which was spearheaded by the Netherlands and France. And um, it was for the first time that uh, 66 countries signed a joint statement, which is not a treaty, but it's an opinion of 66 countries that uh, violence against uh, homosexual people um, should be uh, outlawed and uh, there should not be any impunity. In 2009, the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, came to the UN and gave uh, a statement that they also support decriminalization of homosexual conduct. And last year, in December 2010, um, the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon opened our side event and Mrs. Susan Rice, the American um, ambassador to the United Nations, gave a wonderful speech where she said that um, a vote uh, on another resolution would be opened, reopened, and a majority of countries was for the first time in history of the UN voted in favor of sexual orientation. Um, there are some international developments which are very, very um, current and very important. Um, we've been working with this uh, core group of countries and core group of NGOs, and uh, we managed to persuade South Africa to introduce a resolution in June 2011, so a few months ago, uh, at the um, United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva. And the resolution which uh, South Africa submitted says that uh, violence against gays, lesbians, bisexual people, transgender people should stop. Um, there should be... Um, decriminalization of homosexual conduct and the resolution asked the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mrs. Pillay, to uh, re do research and to come up with a document this coming December. Uh, we work now together with the Office of uh, the High Commissioner and um, I hope that in December this document will be produced where uh, the High Commissioner will give a survey of in which countries the situation for homosexual people is dire and where um, things need to be done. Then um, the Human Rights Council will discuss that document, which will be presented in December. They will discuss it in March 2012. And that's for the first time that uh, the Human Rights Council officially um, will um, devote its time to sexual orientation and gender identity. And that's really a major breakthrough in comparison with, let's say, five years ago, because then at the United Nations level, nobody wanted to speak uh, about sexual orientation, gender identity. I've seen in the program that there has been a lot of emphasis 
on the uh, recommendations the Council of Europe um, um, supported, and that was um, in uh, early 2010. And those recommendations are very important because there are 47 member states of the Council of Europe, uh, countries like Russia, Turkey, uh, and of course uh, in this region, all the countries. And it's very important that um, these recommendations are really being implemented. And um, for us as NGO, as Human Rights Watch, we uh, look at those countries, uh, because it was unanimously approved, the uh, recommendations of the um, body of ministers of foreign affairs of the Council of Europe. So we really um, monitor which countries did not um, implement those recommendations. And it's a wide range of recommendations in terms of housing, health care, uh, discrimination on the labor market. Uh, all kind of areas of daily life are covered by the uh, Council of Europe's recommendations. And it's also for uh, Montenegro very, very important to really implement those uh, recommendations. I've also seen at the desk when I came in half an hour ago uh, the report Thomas Hammerberg, the um, uh, human rights uh, commissioner to uh, the Council of Europe, has produced uh, last month or two months ago, uh, which is a wonderful document because he compares the um, member states of the Council of Europe, of Europe and he... Uh, points at uh, gaps and shortcomings which uh, need to be amended. So that's where um, non-governmental organizations like Human Rights Watch, but also national um, um, NGOs uh, come into play because um, they need to persuade their government and stimulate their government to... Um, to implement those um, recommendations. And there are also uh, requirements uh, if a country like Montenegro, for instance, wants to join the uh, European Union. So it's very important for a government to work together very well to collaborate with national NGOs. And um, I drew up a short list of things that are uh, required. And a very good, solid anti-discrimination law, which covers sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, diversity um, within the police force, uh, but also in the judiciary. Uh, an ombudsman that uh, will uh, take in complaints uh, about discrimination on the basis of uh, sexual orientation or gender identity in the field of education. Um, homosexuality should be covered. That doesn't mean propaganda for homosexuality, but a very factual account that homosexuality exists and is part of nature. Um, and then all these um, topics should be embedded in local NGOs. And so, uh, like I said, collaboration between a government and local NGOs is very important. So, um, of course, uh, you all have been talking about or hearing about the boycott of this conference by local NGOs here in Montenegro, which I find very unfortunate um, because a conference like this would be the place for NGOs to come up and say, listen, we don't agree, or we think this or that should be done, uh, then such a conference like this one would be wonderful. Because um, if a government needs to step up and needs to introduce uh, new legislation or new policies, um, the first thing uh, you need to do is to have communication with your government and to contact uh, those uh, that are um, responsible and uh, therefore I thought such a conference like this one would be a wonderful uh, opportunity. So it's unfortunate that uh, some of the NGOs are not here, but uh, I hope that, let's say, on the longer term, everybody can work together again and stimulate the Montenegrin government to really implement that, uh, what uh, they have been promising in uh, Strasbourg and in uh, Geneva. Thank you very much. Thank you.